Chapter 6 Love There are many people who will receive without surprise the statement that behind the phenomenon of love, a mystery has lain which the developments of the maturer age are necessarily destined to reveal, and that those methods of rational experiment which, in conjunction with high imaginative powers, have shed light upon so many unsuspected natural truths will, when brought to bear upon the study of the central facts of physical and moral life, make these as plain as all the rest. But it must not be supposed that the more or less fixed possession of the distinctly new order of moral, rational, and physical faculty, such as that to which allusion has been made, will at first be acquired, readily, or by large numbers of people, for its germs lie so deeply embedded, even among the readiest, under coverings that should be dissolved, that it must necessarily in all cases be a slow process of years and of employments carried forward under special conditions of protection and help before the education is completed of that keener perceptive consciousness of what passes in soul and body which characterizes the pioneers of this new departure in human life. Those at the outset are doubtless ready for the struggle who are acutely conscious of the simple self-fact that no other course in life seems worth pursuing but the one which holds out hope, however vague, of acquiring the power of sensational emotion acquaintance with the life currents of the deity, the power of a marriage by soul or mind or touch or sight or all with a possible being who dwells in the fluid spaces of the organism and has, by reason of the changes that are gradually forcing themselves upon the external nature, the capacity for acquiring grosser reality of form and aspect, and then the power of so acute an identification with the whole body of humanity, that no use for life can now be found but to cast it before the feet of the human brotherhood in ceaseless and organic service. These powers are the sum of the offering of his age to man, so far as a phrase will state it to the untrained or the inexperienced, but whosoever finds that in his breast some notes attune and sink with the vibrant sounds of this fair promise, that will take hope and courage when he learns that the living for these things has brought to many another world within the old and made them at home in it, a world where new and different forces play on through faculty and where new faculties by education respond to force a world where new and unexpected confirmation is received of all the hopes idealists have uttered, but where experience now supersedes all need of hope, a world where the work of God goes hourly forward and makes for the redemption of the planet. Of the external evidence afforded by history of the remnants in terrestrial man, of intuitions concerning the bayoon and sex nature of the all-God, we have enumerated the most familiar and, as a limited, though not indispensable, interest attaches to the recollection of what past ages have experienced in connection with deep truths, it will here be in place to remind those in whom the conception of the human duality may be advancing into consciousness, how old, and how intricately connected with every vital phenomenon, is the sense that in this respect man has truly been framed in the image of his Maker. The date at which the general human mind had lost the conscious identification of human sex facts with the holiness of the divine movement in the centers of life must have been inconceivably remote. For, while the sacredness of all attributes of the duality in the Creator is recognized, as we have traced throughout the older religions, they are for the most part silent on the subject of the man-womanhood of the creature. Before the period in remote antiquity to which the inquisitions of modern historical science give us a certain mental access, there had already arisen an extreme confusion in regard to the relation held by the sex passion to the worship of divinity. For we find it at the same time intentionally associated with ceremonies of adoration and degrading those ceremonies into opportunities for many abominations. The earliest myths of the antique Egyptians which have come to light afford remarkable evidence that, however the practices of the subsequent hierarchies may have grown corrupted, there existed previously 
a mode of conceiving the sex relationship which was not only devoid of every sense that it was impure, but held in strict union the idea of all generative processes with that of the one God. As late even as among the Greeks and Romans, we observe in mythology, belief, and practice a current of thought which breaks up in its true into every enormity of social error, but which carries along with it a tradition of the divine origin of human experiences of sex. But before any of those vast personal efforts for the ordering of national and social life were formulated, which we call religious systems, the abuse of every instinct connected with sex life had so immersed humanity in animal abasement that great reformers, in proportion to the strength of the inspiration that they drew from the divine bosom, sought to limit the sex activities within the narrow channel of reproductive necessity and to disconnect them from every lofty aspiration or potent emotion. In the same way the deep wisdom of the moral rulers of life in those middle ages of the world which we think of as antiquity, as well as the sages of latter time, endeavor to reduce to its minimum the influence of woman upon man and to seclude her morally, if not always physically, within the boundaries of a separate existence. In this, they followed the necessities of the conditions in which mankind had for the time become fixed, for, as it will be further explained, long before Zoroaster, a Confucius, a Buddha, a Moses, or a Plato, sought to grasp the problems of morality and point out to men a path of cleanliness and of reason, the womanhood of the earth had lost the power of discrimination in regard to the nature of all those spiritual forces which it is its function to transmit to men, and had become in great part a helpless medium for the transmission of influences which could only weaken if they did not degrade. When the long cycles of the retrogressive era had at last spent themselves, and the centuries began in which the eyes of humanity once more could open fitfully to reconstruct your perceptions, it was necessarily through the safer channel of male wisdom that developments could be effected, by which a slow advance into better conditions was secured, and the date is comparatively recent from which such changes in the subtle and intricate organism of women have been established, as will gradually bring forward the long-buried reserve force of universal femininity, without which the acquisition of completeness in human life is an impossibility. In spite, however, of this unavoidable exile from the spiritual efforts of men and nations of all feminine influence, the latent germ would nevertheless push forth in some strong mind or hover about tradition and take form in the true idea. Plato asserts that originally there was a sex besides the two of men and women, which was the union of the two, having a name corresponding to this double nature which once had a real existence but is now lost. He adds, there was a time, I say, when the two were one. But now, because of the wickedness of mankind, God has dispersed us. Among the most fundamental of the occult doctrines which were gathered by the Kabbalistic teachers is the one which asserts that every soul like God is androgynous in its original state, though it now separates on its approach to the earth into a male and female part but that the reunion of these parts, either by marriage on the earth or after death, is its destined consummation. The Sohar maintains distinctly that this united condition belonged to the unfallen race, those protoplasts whose truly human and perfect bodies partook of none of the gross matter which constitutes ours, but were of a perfectly ethereal and fluid substance possessing the capacity of permeation throughout the spaces of other human bodies and of nature. The statement is attributed by Clement of Alexandria, a father of the second century, to Christ that the divine kingdom would come when two should be one, and that which is without as that which is within, and the male with the female neither male nor female. In later times the idea has reappeared in the form of doctrine under the impulse of various teachers of whom Emanuel Swedenborg of the last century and Thomas Lake Harris of this may be mentioned as the most recent and remarkable. 
but in all that has ever distinguished the passional affection of man for woman, or of woman for man, from the sex instinct of brutes, there lies the blurred delineation of their right to divine human experience and love. Until the ages had ripened when the earth could support for a modicum of time the presence of a being organically charged with burning potencies of a more celestial mortality than could be introduced before, and the quiet labor and august spirit of the man named Jesus of Galilee withdrew before the scorching hatred of his then intolerable virtue, the sensations accompanying erotic attraction despite the traditional association of them with human receptivity into divine influences, were incapable of assimilating any elements which should purify and poetise the mutual relation of the woman and the man into the dignity of a sentiment. The bombshell of penetrating particles which bursts upon the world by the career of that short-lived Christ scattered its myriad germs of slow-ripening moralities upon no region of the human soil so freely as upon those sensitive structures in spirit and body by which the creative responds by sentiment or sensation to currents of sex life from God above, or from the animal world beneath. The missiles discharged through the faithful obedience of this man of burning purity to the high law of the peculiar nature with which he stood endowed, almost annihilated at first in those who accepted in thought and endeavor to follow in life the promise of his keen aspirings, all the sex instinct that they possessed. Thus, for some centuries after his departure, the more conscious depositories of those forces which were now abroad in the world, radiative through the organic point of his short life upon it, had only a cold though tender chasteness to oppose the disorders which reigned whenever Ardour accompanied the relations of the sexes. A step full of pregnant import was achieved when, several centuries later, some of the more delicate natures of early medieval days awoke to realize that the nobility of corporal self-restraint was not less compatible with the chivalrous activities of life than with a deep and glowing devotion to the spiritual qualities of women. For this was the sign that the expanding particles of that altruistic substance deposited in humanity by the greatest of Hebrews had begun to leaven with this active power those regions of the human organization the most exclusively dedicated to egotism. This discovery of decent knightliness, that the operative passion for a godly cause, and the restrained passion for a pure woman, were correlative motives for a high and manly living, was in fact a prophetic experience of the more vivid one which responds today to the ardent aspiration for knowledge of the duel in God, the duel in man, and the right devotion to the needs of the earth. Amidst the vice and grossness in which the whole question of passional love has wallowed during the subsequent seven or eight centuries that have elapsed, some choicer natures have accompanied each successive generation to hold before it the standard of increasing purity and self-abnegation and the sex affection to draw that affection more and more toward the plane of religious devotion and to maintain it in the tender realms of the ideal. This general march of sentiment, developing as it has done whole classes of feeling and many modes of thought, for which we find no parallel in the eroticism or ecstasies of civilizations anterior to the insemination in the race of the more potent altruistic germs, has not been confined to the people who avowedly follow what is called the Christian religion, but has been gained throughout the civilized world by every nature of a deep and ardent quality. Yet the high love of men and women is stricken beneath an apparent doom to pain and disappointment. It must suffer, or it must yield something of its virtue and its aspirations to the demands of the imperfect creaturehood, and those today, in whose strong breasts its pulsating motions play, have a keener acquaintance than was offered by any previous period in human history, with the divineness into which this passion soars, and with the hell on earth which seeks to poison or destroy it. Truly, there is a shrouded mystery behind it, but the evolving knowledges of this our time will make it clear. <laughs>